the world actually like cardboard to Superman? So there's a very cool speech that Superman gives to Darkseid in Justice League Unlimited where he says the entire world to him, living in it, is like he has to interact with cardboard. But would you be like cardboard to Superman? Well, I actually read a study this week that was about a wind, I'm gonna scare you about going to the beach, that was about a windblown umbrella that flew across the breach, beach, Pacific Rim tie-in, <laughs> that flew across the beach and impaled somebody. That's morbid, I'm sorry, but what was interesting about it is that they calculated the pressure that it took for this windblown umbrella to go through somebody. Again, morbid, I know, but the value that they came up with was 100 mega pascals and plus 10 mega pascals, 110 million pascals or newtons per square meter. Now, if the world was like cardboard to Superman, I would wager that he could push through you <laughs> with his finger. Now, if it takes this much pressure to puncture through someone, could Superman do that with his finger? Well, if the average surface area of a fingertip, you can measure yours, I measured my own, is one square centimeter, then the force that Superman would have to apply to puncture through you like human, like it was easy as though you were cardboard, would be a hundred, <laughs> not a hundred, even less than that, 11,000 Newtons. And if you think about that, it kind of makes sense, because this is a little bit more than an alligator chomps down on prey with. And alligator teeth are pretty thick, and they puncture into stuff. This is not even close to the limit of Superman's strength. So if he can generate this amount of force at his fingertip, which I argue that he can, he could push through you like a windblown beach umbrella. Wow. It's a common saying. Like, just like a windblown beach umbrella. That's and what did, I, what did I always say? Go watch the Joker episode. Do you know what's really scary? Umbrellas, deadly weapons according to science. It's true. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, where everything is happening right now in the moment, off the top of my head, as you can see by how I read numbers. And this is where I take your comments, your questions live so we can answer them in a little Q&A session uh, that I like to do here in this void that we're all here now. Thanks. How are you? Aaron, we have some comments coming in. Hit me with one. Leon Marsick says, would the Flash blind you when he ran past you? Would the Flash blind you when he ran past you? That's a really good one. What I think is really interesting about the Flash, and I did an article about this once, but if his suit, this is not going to be to scale or accurate, but if his suit is putting out red wavelengths of light and the flash is running towards you at some fraction of the speed of light. Now you're not going to see any effects uh, of this until you get, you know, 0.4 the speed of light. Very, very, very fast. The speed of light is 300,000 uh, 300, kilometers per second. Very, very, very fast. So if the flash has a red suit and it is reflecting red wavelengths of light and he ran towards you, it would appear as though these wavelengths got shorter. And so the color of his suit, apparent to you, would change. Similarly, if he ran away from you, it would change. This is blue shifting and red shifting. We usually talk about it when we're talking about galaxies moving away from us. That's how we know that the universe is expanding as it is accelerating and expanding away from us. And soon everything will be so far away that not even chemical reactions can happen and the universe will die a heat death. But before, <laughs> before any of that, the Flash could run really, really fast and change the color of his suit apparent to you. Or he could run so fast that he would be invisible to anyone because the wavelengths of light would be beyond, before or after, you know, shorter or longer than the wavelengths of visible light. And you wouldn't be able to see him at all. Which kind of makes sense. You don't see him when he's moving super fast, do you? I mean, you see some red streaks, but I think that's artistic license. What's next? Uh, Lego Rocket, Rocket Raccoon asks, in Star Wars Rebels, there are space whales that can fly through the atmosphere and travel through hyperspace. Could this be possible? 
<laughs> uh, space whales that travel through space, could that be possible? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> that depends a lot on what the, the space whale is. I will say this, there's no real size limit to a spaceship, unless you want to move it very, very quickly, because there's no gravity, like, uh, there's, there's gravity in space. Gravity is everywhere, for always, from everything, in every direction, everywhere. But if you're in space and not on the surface of a planet, there's nothing gonna be, there's nothing that's gonna be providing a reactionary force on you. So if you are, we're gonna get into this in a future episode. So I don't know how much, how much we wanna go through it. But if you are orbiting, I'll say this, if you are orbiting above the surface of a planet, you are weightless because, we're talking about whales, right? You are weightless because you are moving, you are, you are falling towards the Earth. There's a component force here that is down and a component, sorry, a component velocity that is down and a component velocity that is horizontal, vertical, horizontal, sideways. So you are still falling towards the Earth, but you have enough horizontal velocity that you are missing it. So you are in a constant state of free fall. That is why you are weightless. If you went up above the surface of the Earth, for example, a thousand kilometers above the surface of the Earth, you would still feel about 70% of the pull of gravity that you would on the surface of the Earth. And so if you went in a spaceship up above Earth and you weren't orbiting, but you were hovering, you would still feel gravity, almost just like you'd feel it here on Earth, which means that space whales would be more feasible the further away they were from a planet's surface. Could they travel? I don't know. How are they breathing? What are they breathing? How would that even work? What kinds of questions are these? What else we got? Mega Parsec asks, could you actually stop a nuclear fission reaction with lightning? <sighs> What's his name? Mega Parsec. Mega Parsec. A Parsec is a unit of distance, not time. And a parsec is roughly equal to, I think I'm getting this right. I don't wanna to have to change this in the show notes like last time when I said the Hobo meteorite was a thousand times more massive than it is, 60 tons. Uh, what are we talking about? Uh, stopping. Mega parsec. Nope. One parsec is 3.26 light years. So mega parsec, your name, would be a million times that, about three million light years long. What'd they ask though? Could you actually stop a nuclear fission reaction with lightning? Uh, nuclear reactions, you can stop them with a lot of things because they are kind of fragile in that they take a lot of conditions to set up. Um, so, I mean, modern nuclear reactors do this very, very well, and that's why they can have runaway chain reactions because the, all, of the, all of the variables are just right. But if you are just trying to have a nuclear chain reaction, you have to have something undergo fission and split, and, and another fissible atom has to be close enough to that fission process that it is going to split and so on, and so on. There has to be a very unique setup of these atoms, a critical mass, that's where you hear that term from, so that these uh, atomic reactions continue. So, could you stop a fission reaction with lightning? Sure, I can, I can see that situation. There was also, there was a situation when they first started doing criticality experiments at Los Alamos, and criticality was testing just this. How close can you get nuclear material uh, how close can you get nuclear material together before it starts starting a chain reaction like this? And uh, they were working with a piece of nuclear material they, they dubbed the demon core because there was a criticality accident with it. And what happened was they were placing a, they had a piece of nuclear material, let's say it was this, and they were piecing a dome over it like so, which is, I guess, a very dangerous uh, poke ball. So they were placing a dome over it like this, and they were seeing how close they could get to closing 
this sphere around this nuclear material without it going critical. Well, one day, a guy got cocky, and it slipped, and it completely closed. And when that happened, the people in the room sa said that they felt a flash of heat and a flash of light. The guy who was standing closest died uh, about a week later from a second of this being fully closed. So if you have the right setup, things can happen very, very quickly and very dangerously. However, you can stop this reaction. All he did to stop the reaction was he had a screwdriver. He just flipped the lid off, stopped immediately. So nuclear reactions are pretty easy to stop, but they're also very quick to run away if they do. You should look that up. Uh, Lewis Stoughton, uh, story of the Demon Core. If you look it up, it's a fascinating story. I love nuclear stuff. What else? J.M. Pickering asks, assuming Johnny Storm flies by means of chemical rocketry, how much heat and fuel would he need to propel his 200-pound body through the air? Okay. This one is actually on my list, so I'm not my list of episodes to do. So I'm not going to go through the whole um, analysis here because I'd have to do math, and I can't do all of it in my head. However, if you are assuming that... What's his, what's his, what's his hero name? What's the hero name uh, for the fire guy? Human Torch. Human Torch. Right. If he was flying, I'm a super nerd. If he was flying uh, like a rocket, he would have to be expelling mass. So he would have to be losing some of his mass, and it would, it would come out of his body at a high velocity, and he would get thrust in the other direction. Like you said, chemical rocketry. I don't know if that's what's happening. Do you see him losing tons and tons of mass to fly at the speeds that he does? I don't know. I think another way through it is to assume that he is burning so hot he might be creating his own uh, intensely strong currents of air around him like infernos do. And he might be using that for thrust. But I have to look into it. I don't know if an inferno can do all of that. But inferno torch also sounds cool to me. So I'll look into it. What's next? Devin Bell asks, if Groot arrives on a planet with lots of carbon dioxide, would he get really big? Um, I don't know. If there's more, if there's more fuel available for Groot to synthesize into uh, matter of himself, then he would grow better, yes. But I also assume that there's some limit to the carbon dioxide intake that plants have. You can't just put them in a 100% carbon dioxide environment and they'd grow fine or better. Um, so... I don't know. It's, it's kind of similar to how there were larger insects when the oxygen content of the earth was higher. I'm sure it would make some difference, but there's probably also a biological limitation to that. I'm not a botanist. <laughs> What's next? Uh, <clears throat> oh, must be hey, an important smart boy one. boy Kyle. What would happen to you and those on board if you attempted to stop a train going at full speed like Spider-Man did in 2004 Spider-Man 2? Call me a smart boy. I like he that. Call you a smart boy. The problem in Spider-Man 2, that's the one with... Doc Ock. Yeah. And he's in front of the train and he has the webs out yes. like this. And he's, yes. Uh, uh, and he right. makes the Tobey Maguire face. Yeah, that classic face. <laughs> yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just like that. Yep. I should go out for more auditions. Um, that, as long as the strength of the silk, of the... Of the it's not synthetic. Organic spider silk in Tobey Maguire's hands is strong enough, which it definitely could be. Um, the tensile strength of spider silk is crazy strong. And I calculated once that if, uh, if the spider silk was literally about this thick, thick of like, you know, somewhere between piano wire and a pencil, then you could hang on it and it would support your weight just fine without breaking. And in that scene, it looks like Spider-Man had a lot of webbing on either side of the train. So if the webbing can take that force, that's, that's fine. What the problem is, is the change in acceleration. And when you decelerate very, very quickly, you are applying force to your body. And when that force gets too high, you die, <laughs> in the simplest terms. Um, you don't die until you get around you know, 50 Gs, 100 Gs, and that is determined on how quickly you go from some velocity down to zero. Change in velocity is acceleration. And in that scene in Spider-Man, it looks like Tobey Maguire is spending quite a bit of time to slow down the train. 
even at a, it seems like almost a comfortable amount of deceleration. So I think the people inside of the train would probably be fine. It doesn't look like they are decelerating all that fast. And that would be the real problem. That's why you have seatbelts in a car, because you decelerate so fast during a car crash, you need something to stop you. But if you are decelerating slow enough that you can kind of just deal with it and brace yourself, and friction on your butt on your seat is keeping you there, then it's fine. Spider-Man 2, validated. What else we got? Brucifer asks, how much of Pacific Rim tech is possible? Nice. A lot um, of people are asking about Jaeger tech, too. A lot of people asking about Jaeger tech. Why? Is it possible? Are we close? I mean, because the movie's coming out soon. The movie's coming out soon. Uh, uh, how much, uh, what in Pacific Rim is possible? Hmm. Are we close to anything like drifting? I've seen a lot of that. Drifting. The cool thing about the drift, <laughs> Maka, we can do this, we can seal the breach. I'm an American actor. Um, the we're a subsidiary of Legendary uh, Pictures. Uh, the cool thing about the drift is that it is based on, I know it's based on this, brain machine interfaces. And what they were thinking is, what if someone like a fighter pilot, this is something that like the Department of Defense looks into, what if a fighter pilot could have a brain machine interface with the jet such that it would take off some of the neural load of having to fly the jet? These are things that we are actually testing, especially um, interfaces like think about when we wire up um, a chimp or another ape like ourselves with a robot arm which is then articulated by uh, the animal's brain. This is a brain machine interface. Down the line, if that gets more and more advanced, I don't really see any reason why we couldn't connect with machines via our minds in a more meaningful way. This is also what Elon Musk wants to get at with his Neuralink uh, company. He wants to have something in the brain that can interface with artific artificial intelligence before it gets, you know, out of hand. So I think if anything in the Pacific Rim universe, brain, mis brain machine interfaces will probably happen in some respect before we have the ability to make robots that are 300 feet tall and move around just fine. In the first movie they say, Gypsy Danger, no alloys. Nice. Alloys are what make most of human engineering possible. That's what steel is. You want them alloys. <laughs> What's next? Raina Rutherford asks, could Superman adapt to or build an immunity to kryptonite? Oh. Has it ever been established how kryptonite works? Probably. Probably. Um, but this is the this is kind of the problem I went through in my Iocane powder episode where if something is a toxin to you, some things can be so potent that your body is never going to be able to mount a response through antibodies or something like that. Like it could, like, uh, like horses uh, have antibodies in their blood that react to snake venom, which we use, thank you, which we use uh, their an horse antibodies to make anti-venoms. I know you say anti-venom, but it's actually anti-venoms. Uh, that are, are antidotes for snake venom. Horses can do that. But potent, potent poisons are hard for our bodies to deal with because usually there's not enough time or react, your, your immune system can't react in the same way because it's not evolved to. Um, so there are some poisons and toxins that you would arguably never, ever, ever be able to form an immunity against. So it depends what, Krypton, what kryptonite actually does to Superman's cells. If it's just blocking sun energy from getting to his cells, I don't know. Any any character with, uh, you know, five decades of history, it is so hard to analyze any part of them because there's always some panel that says, nah, what if it was this? But what if it wasn't? What else we got? Uh, in Back to the Future, when they go back in time, they leave flames on the ground where the tires were. What speed would the car have to be going at to cause that? Good question. That sounds like an episode in and of itself. Um, what speed would you have to go at such that the rubber left, the, the rubber, had, uh, the contact, the, the friction, the frictional force, which is a, so, uh, oh man, I'm just doing it in real time. 
if, if the wheels are on the ground, they provide a normal force on the ground, and the frictional force, the uh, coefficient of kinetic friction applied to this normal force, if the car's going this way, that's gonna provide a force this way. How much of that force do you need to bring the rubber to a temperature such that it is the ignition temperature of rubber? Because that's what pieces of rubber on the ground is, is, is what I'm assuming. It's laying down a track of rubber that's coming off and that's, that's what's being on fire. I have no idea off the top of my head. But I think you can see that just set it up like this and then you can look up some terms and then you, uh, you get the answer. That's basically this whole show. <laughs> do that. What's next? Yellow Dude asks, could we have pod racers in the near future? This isn't one of our producers, is it? it I mean, could be. I now, mean, this is I pod caught, racing? I caught one of them. I know what one username Could is. we have pod racers in the future? Um, yes. <laughs> Frequels confirmed. Only because it looks like pod racers are just two large jet engines connected. Uh, the the electrical link that's connecting the pod racers doesn't make sense in the Star Wars universe because it wouldn't be providing a a tensile force. It wouldn't be holding those things together. If you if you create an electric arc um, in like a Jacob's ladder and you take the Jacob's ladder apart, you don't feel a force that's pulling it back towards itself. But if you just had two jet engines and you put a you know link a chain that was really strong between them, you could do more or less the same thing. How would they keep themselves off the ground though? You would need additional jets pointing up upwards. And your, <laughs> and your pod would probably drag along the ground the whole way, unless it was also being supported. And the more that you try to engineer around the problems that I am mentioning, you're like, oh, well it should go forward, but it should also go up, and you don't want to be dragging on the ground. Oh, we made an airplane. <laughs> That's why, I mean, a pod racer is a bad airplane. <laughs> it's an airplane without wings if, if you just gutted it. And, ah! You know. So yes. You know. Yes, of course. Let's make pod racers. This is pod racing. Now this is pod racing. Now this is pod racing. I'll try, I'll try sciencing. That's a good trick. Okay. Nice. Thank well, you. Well played. Thank you. Samuel Svensuk asks, mm. question, how much jello does it take to be saved from falling at terminal velocity? What? Why are you thinking about that? Cushion. Yeah, why are you thinking about that, buddy? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, because I, I don't know what <sighs> the kind of... Uh, how about this? Uh, terminal velocity for a person, depending on their position, a person, I don't know, my size, average person size, is your terminal velocity is going to, I'm sorry I don't know this in metric off the top of my head, but I know it's around 120 miles per hour. So no matter how high you fall from, if you are, well, not no matter how high you fall from, if you, if you fall from a tall enough distance, yeah, that's, that's correct grammar. Without hitting the ground first, you will reach this speed when, gra when the force, uh, when the tug of gravity the force of gravity on your body is canceled out by the force of drag on your body, you will stop accelerating and you will just continue on at a constant velocity downwards, which we call the terminal velocity. That's around 120 miles per hour. No matter what you hit at that speed, it's gonna be rough. The jello, I don't know if you need an amount of jello, more so you need a a depth of jello, if that makes sense. So even if you you know that water is very good at cushioning things, but if you hit it at 120 miles an hour, you're gonna die. That's what happens. But you want to be able, you want just like what we were talking about with Spider-Man's train, you want to slow down slowly. The slower you slow down, the better off you're gonna be. Um, so, if you made like a tower of jello that you could go into face, not face first, feet first, like in a, into a ballistics gel target like bullets do, and you just come down, and you slow down slowly, you might be able to survive. Although I would prefer it's spaghetti, warm spaghetti. 
but that's just kind of gross. Don't Would it have sauce on it or just be plain? Don't interfere with my dreams. <laughs> what do we got next? Or warm <laughs> rising bread dough. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Okay, uh, him Rourke, I wasn't here at the start, but the symbol on the bottom begs the question, could Pokeball technology exist? Mm. In my, my, my pet theory, because I got to catch them all, about how Pokeballs work is the same way that uh, Ant-Man's suit is supposed to work, which is something <laughs> like this. So, uh, humble brag, I know the guy who they hired to come up with how Ant-Man's suit is supposed to work. And it go, no matter how theoretic, no matter how practically possible it is, theoretically, if you have a nucleus of an atom, and you have, now this isn't exactly accurate because electrons are kind of, are, are more like clouds. They don't orbit like little planets around a nucleus. They're more like clouds that are in every place at once. That's why quantum mechanics is weird. Now, if you have an atom like this, structured like this, there is some distance that you could reduce between the electrons and the nucleus of the atom. And if you do that, because what separates atoms from each other, what makes it so you can never really touch anything or anyone, oh, is the repulsion between electrons at the surface of matter. So if you were to reduce this distance, Everything would be able to come closer before being repelled again. Now, if you did this to every single atom somehow, pim particles, or Pokétech, <laughs> if you did that to every atom inside of an organism, in theory, that organism would be able to come closer to itself. Shrink. So, whatever can do that in here, I think that would be the path, rather than digitizing uh, Pokemon. Although, that is how they get into Bill's PC. So it's more complicated than that. I already have an SSN ticket. I don't need to, I'm going on vacation. What's next? Um, Banana Envelope 384 <laughs> asked, what? what would happen if the moon shattered? Hey, what is, a what, is, what is a banana if not just an envelope for fruit? That's, that's true. Thank you. Um, what happened if the moon shattered? Well, it wouldn't make any difference gravitationally for about, for some amount of time, like less than a second. But, I don't know, the moon, I'm not an astrophysicist, but the moon uh, has a lot of effects on the Earth, not just the tides and, uh, and, and gravitational effects. It shaped how a lot of earthen processes happen. If we lost the moon, that would be really, really bad. And if it fell out of orbit, it would, like in this example, if it stopped orbiting, if it shattered and its velocity either way stopped, so it wasn't in free fall, it would fall straight down to Earth. And the moon is big, and by the time it reached Earth's surface, it would be going very, very fast. It would probably, you could probably wipe out life on Earth. Be bad. I mean, it's falling from 384,000 kilometers away, depending on its speed. Millions of kilograms hitting the Earth's surface. Oh man, Great. pretty bad. Yeah, a little bit. What's next? Wait, one more question. We have time for one this more quick. question. Rumble82 asks, is the Mandela effect real and is it caused by time travel? <sighs> quickly, quickly. Quickly, quickly. It, it just makes me so mad. What? Okay, okay, I'm not gonna get mad. I'm not gonna get salty, but. Don't get salty. When. Don't go to crate. When, when the Baron Stain Berenstein thing happened, and people said, well, it must be a parallel universe. Okay, I'm just... What is more likely? That we have confirmed the existence of a parallel universe based on a book that you half remember, or you were slightly wrong? What seems more likely? That you misremembered. It's has no, has n Berenstain, Berenstein has nothing to do with time travel, nothing to do with parallel universes, nothing of the sort. It has everything to do with the frangibility of human memory and the odd effect that social media has in amplifying small and vocal views. Wow, that was one of the most coherent I've ever, I've ever been. Together. There's a lot of rage coming up, but you, you're professional. Bottle it up. 
until it bursts out at a different time. Yep. Because psychology. That's it. Thank you so much for joining me for this uh, episode of Because Science Live. Uh, If you missed any of this or you joined us halfway through or uh, near the end, you can go back. We're going to upload this full video to YouTube, and you can see it there. Thank you so much for your comments and your questions. I look forward to answering more of them in next Tuesday's vlog. A lot of people are mad about what I said, how you can pick up a car. I know how to, I know what a jack is, but, (laughs) but we'll get to that. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, Three more Because Science stuff next week. I hope to see you there and uh, be nice to each other because this is all we got. Bye.